Welcome to another episode of Joan Deserves a Musical, where I talk about my efforts to turn the life of Joan of Arc into a family-friendly animated musical. And here, um, I want to, I don't want to say I need to apologize. I don't want to say I made a mistake, but I want to tell you something that I think is really demonstrative of the creative process, at least as I have been experiencing it in this project and other projects I've worked on. A couple of episodes ago, I had an episode called Deleted Scene, where I deleted a scene during the episode. And it was an introductory scene where the saints who were telling the story of Joan of Arc in the screenplay, as I've written it, are, uh, are, are, are they're telling the story to some unborn babies. And the unborn babies are saying cute, funny things. Um, and I deleted it for, I think, good reason. That was the only scene in the movie where the unborn baby said anything. They were the opening scene. They were really adorable. And it kind of set up this expectation that we were going to see more of them, that we were going to get to spend time with them. But we never see them again. And so it, it felt like a, a misset, misleading expectation. It was taking up space. It wasn't accomplishing anything. So I deleted it. And everybody hated that decision. Amanda, my songwriter, hated it. My wife, Katie, hated it. Uh, I didn't love it, but I thought I was sacrificing and making the right choice. Uh, lots of feedback that it was just, everybody wants the unborn babies back. So I, I was really thinking about how, what, what can we do with them? The reason they were there is Amanda feels very strongly that if you're going to have narrators telling a story, they should be telling the story to someone, not just to the audience. Um, and, uh, and so she really liked the idea. It was actually her idea to have the, the saints talking to unborn babies, telling them the story of Joan of Arc. Um, and so at, when I was in Portland a couple of weeks ago and Amanda and I met in person, I told her, you know, I just, I deleted the unborns cause uh, I don't, she was like, what, why? And we talked about it and she was say, making suggestions. And then I said, oh, what you want is something like the princess bride with the grandfather telling the story to the son. And she's like, yes, that's it. That's what I want. I want something like that. And so I spent some time reflecting on the princess bride and the device that is this conversation between the grandfather and the son and wondering why it works because we don't see them on screen a whole lot. But I think there are a few things, I should have numbered these ahead of time. There are at least two, maybe three things that I think are really important about this. The, the most basic one is we, uh, we see them periodically throughout the movie. We see them at the beginning and the end, of course, but also what's really delightful about this, this device as, as William Golding wrote it is that there, there is interplay between these two, right? Um, occasionally you cut back to them in the bedroom talking and occasionally you just have voiceover of them talking. I always loved, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the kid says, I forget what it is, something like, see, I told you um, whatever happened. And, and the grandfather says, this is all voiceover as the action is happening. Yes, you're very smart now, shut up, uh, right? There's just this, it's not like a, a normal narrator, this omniscient, you know, Charlton Heston voice uh saying you know this is what's going on it it's it, it's character building and it it makes us love them and and care for them and so that was what amanda and i agreed needed to happen we'll we'll do a few different scenes very short with the the saints and the unborns but we'll give them some sort of interplay back and forth so that there is there's actual character there and sometimes it can be off screen it can just be voiceover but that's going to make it more worthwhile but as I thought about it more, I realized that is actually the least interesting part of what's happening in The Princess Bride. The Princess Bride, if you think about it, uh, Buttercup and Wesley and, and all these things, it's a great story. And that's what people think of when they think of the movie The Princess Bride, right? They're thinking about uh, the pit of despair or the fire swamps or, 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 or you know, the battle of wits or the sword fighting or, or one of these things, right? That is the story. It would have been perfectly fine to just tell that story, it would have been a great movie. Um, it, and yet that's not what, what happened. They have this element, this device of the grandfather telling and sort of abridging the story to the, the boy, um, because that's a very important part of the actual book if you've ever read it. Uh, but again, they could have abandoned that. They could have just told the story of, of Wesley and Buttercup. But what they do is they have the grandson and the grandfather interacting in such a way that they actually go through the boy the kid goes through an arc he has character development which is wild for a narrator like maybe to, i can't think of another example of this happening to show you let's start out at the very beginning we, the opening scene the boy is sick in bed he's playing video games his mom comes in to tell him his grandfather's coming and here's what happens 
can't you tell me I'm sick? You're sick. That's why he's here. He'll pinch my cheek. I hate that. Maybe he won't. Hey, how is this sicky? Huh? All right, this boy is clearly unexcited to have his grandfather here. There's no reason to believe they have a bad relationship, right? We can forgive him. He's sick. He's in bed. He wants to play his video games. He doesn't want to be bothered. He doesn't love that his grandfather pinches his cheek. Um, but uh, that's that's where we start. And then by the end, we get here. Grandpa? Maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. So somehow by sharing this story, they have come together. They, they, they feel like they've been a journey, on a journey together the way a, a good story can make us feel. And the boy now loves his grandfather and wants him to come back. And, and, and his grandfather says, as you wish, which is a way of saying, I love you. Um, and it's very nice. It's very sweet. But what's really interesting to me is how we get here. It's not just, you know, we open, they don't like each other. We hear the story. And then at the end, they do like each other. Um, as I mentioned, there's this interplay between the two of them as the story goes along. And that represents the boy getting more invested in the story. And we have this moment in the middle where we can really see how invested he's getting. She doesn't get eaten by the eels at this time. What? The eel doesn't get her. I'm explaining to you because you look nervous. I was nervous. Well, maybe I was a little bit concerned, but that's not the same thing. Because we can stop now if you want. No, you could read a little bit more if you want. And that's really great. Uh, there, there's another one, right, where he asks, who gets Humperdinck? And the grandfather's like, nobody gets Humperdinck. And they have this fight. You can see the boy is getting really invested in this story that he was not at all interested in hearing at the beginning. And in the beginning, he interrupts sometimes, like, oh, is this a kissing book? Like, oh, what are you reading to me? But by the end, he's like, okay, with the kissing, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's just really nice. So what we have here is the boy is initially thinking this story is going to be boring and no good. But the story wins him over. And because of that, his grandfather, who is the one who introduced the story to him, uh, the boy sort of falls in love with, for, for lack of better words. Obviously, nothing romantic here. But the boy goes from not wanting to see his grandfather at all to wanting his grandfather to come back the next day. He goes from not wanting to hear this story at all to wanting to hear it a second time. And so that's really interesting. That's really remarkable. That is a, a level of thoughtfulness around a narrator and around character development and the definition of what a character is and who gets a character art that is just really stunning. Um, and so in the current draft, that's what we're going for. The unborn babies are back. Uh, the conversation they had at the beginning is, is now, uh, it's gone. Uh, a, a, a smaller version of it happens somewhere in the middle. But basically, we have a, an opening scene where there's an unborn baby who doesn't want to be in unborn baby class. And the saints decide to tell her this story to draw her in. And by the end, uh, she, uh, you know, she, she's participating and happy and whatever. Um, but the thing that I, this has done that I didn't expect it to do that's actually been really helpful is if you remember that, that, that scene with the eels and the Princess Bride, the grandfather can interrupt and say the eel doesn't get her. This isn't going to be that bad. This, for me, is it, it opens powerful opportunities because the story of Joan of Arc, one of the concerns my executive producer contact has given me is that it's just too dark, right? There's one part in a battle where Joan takes an arrow to the neck. That is, that is too graphic for an American children's movie, right? And, uh, and, and, and what are we going to do about that? Because this is an important moment. We can't skip it in the story. Well, now we can have the buildup. We can have all the tension. We can have the battle scene. And then we can go to have voiceover narration. You know, an enemy soldier, an enemy archer takes aim and draws back an arrow. And, and then we can cut back to the saints telling the story to the unborns and say, and they let the arrow fly and the unborns all scream. Oh, no. Right. And uh, it lightens it without having this skip the scary parts. Um, so this is a really cool step forward. Um, I, I've written it all out. I've put it in. And I think I have a final draft of this thing. I have a friend who uh, used to work in television. He is currently reading my script. He'll let me know if it's terrible. Um, but uh, we're, we're getting really close here. Uh, it is, it is mid-July as of this recording. 
Um, I am I am e emailing back and forth with this executive producer. We're hoping to meet up sometime in August. Um, if we can't do it in person, then uh, then I'm going to push for Zoom. But I, I think we are almost there. And I'm excited to bring you with me on this final leg of the first part of the journey, which is getting the script into the hands of an animation studio. What happens after that is a mystery to me, and we will discover it together, but I will keep you in the loop.